Welcome to West London Alliance. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. As we begin, let me direct your attention to the connection card that's in the seat in front of you that has some QR codes uh, that will link you to information for various ministries here in the church. And of course, uh, that uh, there's another QR code that would allow you to sign up for our weekly email uh, that would uh, provide all of the information ongoing week to week that happens here at West London Alliance. And in fact, that's the best way to in fact stay up to date with all of the events. Today is the final day for adult Sunday school, uh, the class on four views on the book of Revelation. For those of you who have signed up, the meeting will take place at 1245 in the Explorer Room. At the same time, today is Soup Sunday, and it's an opportunity to have lunch together as a church. Now, normally, uh, the organizers have asked uh, people to sign up in advance, but uh, if you're a newcomer, uh, you're more than welcome to join in, and that's happening at 1230 today in the core. Uh, next Sunday, uh, November 12th, uh, Pastor Graham will be teaching a class uh, on evangelism, and the class is designed to help us feel less intimidated about sharing our faith and Graham will be providing some helpful tools and practical next steps to uh, help us engage in this discipline. So that's next Sunday, November 12th at 11 a.m., 11 to 1. It's happening in the Grasshopper Room. Lunch is provided, and there's a requested $5 fee to be paid in cash at the event. And uh, it would be helpful for those wanting to attend to register on Eventbrite. So that's the evangelism class. And finally... Uh, there is a men's ministry lunch where the men of the church are enjoy invited to join together for lunch and fellowship. That's happening Sunday, November 19 at 1230. That's happening in the gym and registration again is on Eventbrite. So be encouraged to uh, find those QR codes in the connection card, get connected, uh, join in with the uh, weekly email to keep up to date with all of the events going on. Well, we're here this morning to worship God, and it's good for us to be reminded that God has called his people together to worship him and to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and that's from 1 Peter 2.9. In a moment, we will come together to the communion table to partake. And so while we're singing our first song this morning, let's be encouraged to bless the Lord and to praise his holy name in song. And as believers, let's do so drawing near to God with a sincere heart, fully assured in our faith, as the author of Hebrews tells us. But at the same time, let's take care to examine our hearts and ensure that we approach the communion table in a worthy manner meaning with an understanding of the gravity of our sin, yet also with the gratitude and joy and gladness for the salvation given to us through Jesus. So I invite you to stand now if you're able and join your voice in singing, Jesus paid it all. Let's sing together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, 
change the leopard's spot and melt the heart. And Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. sing together, oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave. Oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh praise the Shall still repeat. We sing together. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it. And Jesus paid it all. And Jesus paid it all. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Congregation can be seated. Here at West London Alliance Church, we practice what we call open communion. And by open communion, we mean that the Lord's table is open to all those who have come to faith in Christ through repentance and through believing and entrusting themselves to Jesus and his work of redemption. If that is you, we welcome you to celebrate with us. We would ask that if you have never surrendered your life to Christ, that you participate, but that you participate in a different way. We would ask that you let the emblems pass you by and that you participate through observation and through contemplation. We would ask that you observe, that you would listen and watch as we celebrate what Christ has done. 
and then contemplate and consider what Christ has done and consider availing yourself of his work for those who put their faith in him. I'm going to ask those who are serving uh, communion to make their way to the front to remain standing. I'll remind the congregation that as they serve and as Barry plays his music, we have a few moments of time there to continue to prepare our hearts to serve communion and so to do that. So let's go to the Lord now as we prepare. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but rather in your Therefore, gracious Lord, to eat this bread and drink this cup, that our bodies and souls may be made clean by Christ's body and blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. We thank you that he made there a full atonement for the sins of the world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. And we thank you that he instituted and in his gospels commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. And so we do. Amen. And the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he gave God thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ which was given for you. Preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your heart 
by faith and with thanksgiving. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave God thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Almighty and everlasting God, we wholeheartedly thank you for you have graciously given us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you assure us thereby of your favor and your goodness towards us. And you assure us that we are members in the body of your Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people. And you assure us that we are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom by the merits of Christ's most precious death. We humbly ask you, O Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Our celebration of the Lord's Supper symbolizes our participation in Christ's redemptive work and the establishment of God's kingdom on earth through his Son. But it also serves as a, our glorious and, and hopeful reminder of what awaits us in the future, that day where we will fully experience the presence and glory of God. And so as we glory in the cross of Christ and praise him for the shedding of his blood to cover our sins, we also pray as Jesus taught us to your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we can do that joyfully in song this morning. So I invite you to stand, join your voices together as we sing, let your kingdom come. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray your King. Come, come, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere. Let your kingdom come. Give us your strength, O oh God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test. By grace, we'll preach your gospel. Our dying breath. Let your kingdom come. 
Let your will be done so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Sing, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth, till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Amen. You may be seated. I'll ask the children to come up and join me up front. As the kids are making their way up, uh, I'll just let the congregation know that uh, the kids will not be with us at the start of service. Uh, they'll be spending the next five to six weeks uh, preparing for their Christmas uh, singing. And so that's where they will be. We'll miss them while they're gone, but we'll be anticipating uh, them coming uh, around Christmas time in December uh, to uh, praise God as a choir of young people. Uh, we don't do catechism on Communion Sundays, and so we're going to pray for the kids and dismiss them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. We acknowledge that they are a blessing to their families and to this church. Father, we're grateful for them. We pray, Father God, that you would save each one of them, that you would uh, open their eyes to your glory in the face of Jesus. Only you can do that, Father God, and so we would ask you to do so. We pray, Father God, over the next few weeks as they prepare to worship you in song at Christmas time, that you would be with them and with their leaders. And we pray for them and their leaders this morning, that as they go to their class, they would learn of you. We ask you to watch over them today and the rest of this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you're dismissed. You can make your way to your classes. Uh, we also, on Communion Sundays, have the junior highs with us. And so junior highs, I'm not going to call you up to the front, but I am going to ask you to stand up because we are happy to have you guys with us in our uh, service and in our worshiping of God. And I want to pray for you as well before you go to your class. So congregation, let's pray for our junior highs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these young men and women uh, who are growing up to learn about you and to serve you. And we pray, Father God, as we did for the young ones, that you would save each one of them. And having saved them, Father God, you would cause them to grow in godliness and to be conformed into the image of Christ, even as you have promised to do. We pray, Father God, with, in regards to the struggles that they face uniquely, that you would strengthen them, that you would empower them, and that they would lean into you, Father God. We ask you to help them to learn to be creatures of the word, that they would go to your word regularly and learn from it. And we pray that you would bless them as they go to their class. Again, that they would learn of you, they would learn your truth and learn your love. And they would become enamored by our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Watch over them today and the rest of this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Junior highs, you're dismissed. As the junior highs make their way out, I'll ask one of our elders, Barry Usher, to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Let's join together in prayer this morning. Almighty and eternal God, we come before you seeking rest for our 
weary hearts and weary minds, and we do so in the knowledge of your unchanging nature. Father, in our world where everything is transient and decaying, we find our solace and our security in your steadfast and unwavering nature. And so we echo the words of Psalm 102 in our prayer, and we say, of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, but you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Father, you are the cornerstone of all creation, including our lives. And we praise you for the comfort and security we find in your unchanging nature, knowing that your character remains unwavering, your promises remain unshakable, and your purposes unyielding. And Father, we praise you for your son Jesus, through whom the truth of your unchanging nature has been made known with abundant clarity. He is the one who is the radiance of the glory of God and the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the one who you have placed on your eternal throne to rule and reign in justice. And he is the one your word declares is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, that assures us of your promises, that they are reliable, and that what you have said, you will do. So, Father, in this quiet moment of prayer, I ask that you would please calm our anxious hearts and still our distracted minds with knowledge of this truth. Brothers and sisters, take a moment of independent personal prayer. Father, as we come to you finding refuge in Christ alone, we acknowledge our own shortcomings born from our sin in light of your perfect, eternal, and unwavering holiness. Lord, we confess that we've often doubted your character, giving into fear and anxiety when confronted with life challenges, forgetting that you are the unchanging rock of ages. Father, forgive us for our lack of faith and for trying to rely on our own limited understanding and strength. Father, we also confess that we have let our human weaknesses overshadow your infinite might. And in our pride, we've neglected your word, we've neglected prayer, and we've neglected trust in your divine providence. Father, help us to repent and to live as those filled with your spirit and to keep in step with him. Guide us in all circumstances to obey your will, to grow in our salvation and our sanctification to grow in our submission to you and grow also in our willingness to suffer for the sake of the gospel as you will. Lord, we acknowledge that our words and our attitudes and our actions towards others have often fallen short of your commands. Forgive us, we ask, for the ways we have sinned against you and the ways we've sinned against each other. Father, we remain sinners in need of a Savior. Help us not to seek salvation or atonement for our sin through our own efforts or strengths, but instead, as Paul reminded Timothy, to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Jesus, enable us to submit to your lordship in every aspect of our lives and steadfastly rely on you as our sole source of righteousness and peace and hope. And Father, it's with this attitude of submission that we bring our requests to you. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who are in need of healing, who are in need of specific provision, who are in need of strength and, and comfort. And amidst these needs, I ask you to help us to find joy and hope, patience and affliction, and faithfulness in prayer as we call out to you. Specifically, I lift up to you Steve and Paula Reibling. We ask that you would heal Steve as he remains in hospital. May his blood pressure stabilize. We ask that you prevent any further need for intubation and restore his full cognitive function. God, grant Paula and the family an extra measure of your grace during this challenging time. And Lord, we lift up Megan St. John as she travels to Egbe, Nigeria to serve with Samaritan's Purse World Medical at the ECWA Hospital as a nurse. Grant her safe travels, strength to work for your glory, and opportunities to share the gospel while she's away from us. And Father, we lift up Pastor Reese and our brothers and sisters at, at JSAC. Provide them with the endurance and strength they need to grow as a young church. 
help their new believers to grow quickly in maturity and to grow in their eagerness to serve you and to worship you and enable each one of their members to be effective evangelism, evangelists so that their church may grow both in obedience and in numbers. And Father, we lift up our own missionaries, Marcel and Carol, Kelly Boers, serving with MAF in Angola. Father, we ask that you would give Kelly the strength she needs as a teacher uh, to support uh, her work with that. Lord, bless her as she supports Marcel's work and as she's a mother to Ethan, Avro, and Silas. Give both of them opportunities to continue to spread the gospel and grant them safety and, and peace and unity as a family as they serve. And so, Father, it's in faith that we say thank you for hearing our prayers. Your faithfulness is our refuge and strength, and for that we give you all the glory and all the honor. And as Pastor Jude comes to preach, give us the clarity of mind we need for understanding, the conviction of heart that's needed where correction and discipline is evident, and strengthen our spirits, I pray, for greater obedience. And may you be honored as we continue to worship you this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Here at Westland Alliance Church, we do not receive tithes and offerings during the course of the service. If you brought those with you, there is a box at the back of the sanctuary. It's on your right-hand side as you leave. You can deposit those things there, and they will be taken care of. If you have any interest in giving online or digitally, uh, you can get information about that from our church office or from our website. Uh, we continue to be thankful to God for his provision for this church through your faithful giving. I'm going to ask Alicia Usher to come up for the public reading of God's Word. Today's scripture passage is from 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. There were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves." And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord, 
And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we return this morning to our sermon series through the book of 1 Samuel. Our last sermon from this series focused on the seventh chapter, and it was preached on June 25th. Of course, since then, we have worked, continued working our way through the Psalms, 13 of them, in fact, and we just completed a five-week sermon series on mission. But we'll begin this morning because of our absence, by summarizing the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel so that as we consider today's text, chapter 8, uh, we have some context for that. So I remind you that in the first chapter of Samuel, we were introduced to a husband and to a wife, two wives in fact. Elkanah was married to Peninnah and Hannah, and Hannah was barren. Hannah, while visiting the sanctuary of the Lord, prays to God for a son, and she is assured by the priest, Eli, that God will, in fact, grant her request. Hannah has a son and is, names him Samuel and vows to dedicate him to the Lord. The second chapter of 1 Samuel begins with a memorable prayer from Hannah which gives thanks to God. It emphasizes the Lord's power, the Lord's sovereignty, and the Lord's justice. And at the same time, it contrasts the fate of the righteous and the fate of the wicked. We learn that Samuel is growing in favor with God and with people. And this is in stark contrast to the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who act wickedly. The next chapter sees Samuel serving in the tabernacle under Eli, and this is where we encounter the story of Samuel hearing the voice of God. The initial confusion of Samuel mistaking the voice he hears as that of Eli's is cleared up when finally Eli realizes that it is the Lord calling Samuel. And so Eli instructs Samuel to respond by saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel hears God's voice and hears of the judgment of God against the house of Eli because of their wickedness. In chapter 4, Israel finds themselves fighting with the Philistines and losing the battle. In a desperate attempt to secure victory, the Israelites bring the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh into their camp believing that it will grant them some sort of divine favor like a, a talisman or a good luck charm. However, Israel is defeated. The ark is captured, and the sons of Eli are killed. The fifth chapter sees the captured ark placed in the temple of Dagon, and this results in the statue of Dagon in the temple being toppled. The Philistines reset the statue in its original upright position, only to enter their temple the next morning and find the statue of Dagon not only toppled again, face down, before the ark, but with its hands and its head severed. Following these foreboding events, God plagues the Philistines with tumors. The Philistine citizens no longer want the ark in their vicinity, and after transporting that ark for, to several different cities, which encounter the exact same afflictions, the Philistines return the ark to Israel, sending it away on a cart pulled by two cows who had never pulled a cart before. The cart takes the ark straight to Israel, demonstrating that God is at work. The people of Beth Shemesh receive the ark, but show irreverence by looking inside of it, resulting in the death of many. And then finally, in chapter 7, the ark is brought to kiriath Jerim, where it remains for 20 years. Samuel calls the people 
of Israel to repentance, and they turn away from their idols. Then they defeat the Philistines in battle with God's help, and Samuel is serving as judge over all of Israel. Well, my last sermon that was on that particular victory in battle was entitled, The Lord Helps Israel. Today's sermon is entitled, Israel Rejects the Lord. The contrast between these two episodes is evident. It's evident in the opening verses of today's passage, but before we get there, as suggested by the passage that was just read, we need to take a few minutes to consider this new idea, this new idea of kingship in Israel. Commentator David Samura declares, this chapter is among the most significant in the historical books of the Old Testament, making the transition from judgeship to kingship in ancient Israel. So we will consider kingship in Israel with our first point. Point number one, kingship in Israel. The nation of Israel was comprised of a covenant people who had a special relationship and a special bond with the Creator who had redeemed them out of Egypt. This relationship they had was formalized in the covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai under the leadership of Moses. They would be his people and he would be their God. The nature of this covenant was clear to those who were present. God would be their monarch. He would be their king, and he would reign over them forever. In what many of your Bibles will call the Song of Moses, the Israelites sang of the significance of God redeeming them from Egypt. We read in Exodus 15, 17 through 18. You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. God had demonstrated, and he would continue to demonstrate, that he would provide for his people and he would protect his people. In the covenant at Sinai, God instructed them on how they were to live their lives and promised them blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. So God ruled and reigned over Israel. He was their king. And then we arrive at 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, God is still ruling as the sovereign over Israel. He does things that a sovereign ruler does. He opens Hannah's womb. He brings some low and he exalts others. He calls Samuel to serve him. Even the Philistines recognized the Lord's reign when he afflicted them with tumors. Now God had organized Israel such that there were human rulers that led the people as stewards on God's behalf. Priests were the main office of leadership, and they were given many responsibilities and very much authority. And then in times of crisis, God would also raise up judges. Now, unlike the priests, the judges did not receive their office and their authority based on their heredity and their lineage. Judges were divinely chosen. However, in the time of Samuel, in today's passage, we read of the people of Israel tiring of God's way. And looking for a change, they want a king. Now, understand this. Kingship was always part of God's plan for Israel. Always. God makes a promise to Abraham in Genesis 17, 6, saying, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Further in Genesis 49.10, Jacob, as he's blessing his sons, includes in the blessing of Judah these words. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. 
Further to that, consider God's words delivered by Moses to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it, and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him. And he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Israel could have a king. She could have one that was divinely chosen from among the covenant community. This king was not to be self-serving, but rather his life should be known by his obedience to God and his profound humility. He would not undermine or compromise the sovereign rule and reign of God over his people. So as we enter this section of 1 Samuel, which sees the beginning of the ascension of Israel's first king, Many of us may be anticipating the dawning of a glorious era in the history of Israel. However, the opening verses suggest something different. Point number two, an ominous development, verses one through three. The opening verses of chapter eight alert the reader, the careful reader, to potential problems. These verses record a scenario involving an aging leader who has two immoral sons who have been placed in authority over the people of Israel. Does that ring a bell for anyone? And why would this information be considered ominous? Well, we have seen this before. We've seen this before in the book of 1 Samuel. We know that Eli the priest had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In chapter 2, we read, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Then in chapter 4, with Israel in a battle with Philistine, we read, Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. So there it is. An elderly leader of Israel has two reprehensible sons in positions of authority. What was the outcome of that situation? Israel was defeated by the Philistines. The ark of God was captured. The sons of Eli were killed. Eli himself died when he heard the news. And his daughter-in-law, giving birth to a son, named him Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed from Israel, highlighting the disastrous results of this situation. And so we have good reason to expect that the events that follow, on the whole, may not ultimately be positive. So let's see where this leads. Point number three, a request for a king, verses four through nine. What clearly comes across as a response to Samuel's installation of his sons as judges, we see the elders of Israel confront Samuel and make a proposition. They confront Samuel with the truth of the nation's leadership situation. Samuel is in decline, and his sons do not walk in the ways of his father. They are concerned with Samuel getting old, and with his sons being scoundrels, and what that might mean for the nation of Israel. 
And so they propose that they should have a king. Give us a king to judge us. Now, this proposal was not accepted by Samuel. In fact, we read the thing displeased Samuel. Why would this be displeasing to Samuel? God had promised that Israel could have a king. Moses indicated that this was going to happen and that it could be a successful endeavor. What's the problem here? Well, I think we can see at least part of the problem here if we consider their initial request. Now, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now, if the emphasis of that request was for a king, I think it would be acceptable. But a large part of the emphasis of this request was their desire to be like other nations. God had declared to his people that when they entered the promised land, they were to be different and distinct from all the nations around them. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 23 through 26, and you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I am driving out before you, for they did all these things and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. This seems to be part of the problem with their request. And make no mistake, their request was a problem. Samuel was not the only one displeased with their proposal. God makes it clear that he also is displeased. As we heard in a time of prayer, God instructs Samuel with these words. Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. According to God, this desire and this proposal is a rejection of God. And its motivation seems to be an improper desire, a desire to be like the nations who surrounded Israel because God connects the actions of them in 1 Samuel 8. He connects that with the worship of idols. And so those facts of the first three verses which pointed to something ominous seem to be accurate. Israel has rejected their true king. They've rejected the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God will give them a king, but he will do so and warn them of what that king's reign will be like. Now, God gives this warning to Samuel, and he's to relate it to the people of Israel. Now, before we consider that warning, again, this scene gives us ample opportunity to make an application. We see that both God and Samuel are displeased with this request. God indicates it's a rejection of him in order to improperly embrace other nations and their practices, which includes the worship of their false gods. Now, I think someone, were they to critique the North American church, they might suggest that we struggle in the same way. How much do we as God's new covenant people, desire to be like the unbelievers around us. We could point to many external things which give evidence of this. We want to dress like them. We want to look like them. We want to smell like them. We want to sound like them. We want to enjoy the entertainment they enjoy. We want to spend our money the way they spend their money. We want to live our lives like they live their lives. But it goes deeper than that. We want to be like them. 
because there's parts of us that want to worship the false gods that they worship, or so our actions seem to indicate. If an idol is anything that we go to as a replacement for God, then we might say that some of our main idols in Canadian society and in the church are money, sex, and comfort. Now, I think a little bit of Holy Spirit-inspired introspection might help us discern in our own hearts how we can be guilty of sins like these, of sinful desires like these. It might do us some good to, in prayer, ask some questions like, God, will you please show me the ways that I behave like an unbeliever? as it relates to money or sex or comfort? How do I, God, pursue money in ways that replaces God in my life? How do I, God, think about sex or pursue sex or even act out sexual activities in ways that dishonor you? God, what ways am I captivated by comfort? And how do I desire it as if it were the most important thing? I think if you were to sincerely ask God to reveal your heart on these matters, you might be surprised, or perhaps not, what the Spirit convicts you of. And whatever you're convicted of, let us all be quick to repent. Let us be quick to find our forgiveness in Christ. And let us be quick to ask for strength to walk in a manner worthy of who we are in Christ. We, like the Israelites, even in the pursuit of good things, or at least things that are not inherently evil, we can find ourselves rejecting God if we are not wise and discerning. Let's move on now and consider the warning. Point number three, a warning about kings, verses 10 through 18. Commentator Ian DeGuid expands on the idea that this request was problematic. He says it was not the establishment of kingship per se which caused problems, but the way in which the people sought to preempt divine timing on the matter, pursuing the deficient and pagan concept of kingship of the surrounding nations. Israel's king was to be a covenant king a special type of constitutional monarch who accepted the divine dimension of the rights and duties of kingship as laid out in Scripture. He was to be God's deputy on earth, doing his will, will, and so preserving the Lord's status as Israel's true king. Moreover, Israel's king was to promote the well-being of his subjects and to respect their status under God by adhering to the good and right way laid out in Scripture. If the king adhered to these requirements, Israel would remain a theocracy, a mediated theocracy, which was meant to anticipate Christ's kingly rule. Now, the pagan king, unlike God's intended covenant king, would ultimately be a taker. Six times in the warning, Samuel indicates that the king of the people or the king that the people of Israel desired, he would take things from them. He would take their sons, take their daughters, take their fields, take their vineyards, take their servants, take their flocks, take their herds, and take so much more. A pagan king is a taker. The king the Israelites desired would be a taker. Now this is an excellent time for us to pause and to consider King Jesus and consider how this story points to him and how he fulfills much of what this story exposes as the desires of the human heart. You see, the desire for a ruler who will care for us, provide for us, protect us and prosper us, this is a universal desire. It's in our hearts. But how often we find ourselves looking to a political figure, maybe a prime minister, a premier, or a president, 
Or we find ourselves looking to a spiritual figure, a pastor, a priest, or a pope. We look to them to be the one who can save us. Well, believers and unbelievers alike, I speak to you. You know that this is something that at times you have desired in your heart. But if we're honest, we must admit that even the best leaders and the best organizations they lead often end up taking more than they give. And we continue to look for some Messiah to save us. Well, believers and unbelievers acknowledge this morning the Messiah has already come. And we know that he was the true Messiah, the true one who could save us because he was a giver, not a taker. In the opening section of Paul's letters to Galatians, we read in Galatians 1, 3 through 5, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. See, Jesus is the true king. He's the true savior of the world. And he gives and gave in so many ways. These verses in Galatians indicate five ways that Jesus gave. Jesus gave and gives grace and peace. He gives unmerited favor and a flourishing wholeness with God and men. It says he gave, most importantly, himself. He gave himself as a sacrifice, dying a death on a cross for us because we had become estranged from God. And we were facing God's wrath because of our sin. We had rejected our creator. And Jesus' giving of himself in death also was for the purpose of giving forgiveness of sins and giving deliverance from evil. Jesus, among many other things, through the giving of himself, in his life and his death and his resurrection, gives grace and peace and forgiveness and deliverance by giving himself. And he gives that to all those who believe in him, all those who repent of their sin and trust in him for the very things that he offers to give you. And so this morning I encourage both believers and unbelievers alike to stop looking to earthly kings. Stop looking to earthly rulers and earthly leaders who only end up taking. But turn your eyes and your hearts to Jesus. He's God's king and he's a giver. He gave himself and out of the giving of himself he gives many more gifts. Ultimately, in their pursuit of a king, the nation, or sorry, their pursuit of a king like the nations around them, Israel rejected God. It's my final point this morning. The Lord is rejected, verses 19 through 22. Despite the warning from God, in spite of Samuel's displeasure, the people refused to obey Samuel, saying, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. If there was any doubt that Israel's focus on acquiring a king like the nation was wrong, this demand shows they were wrong. They were looking for someone to fight their battles. Well, Throughout the history of Israel, it was Israel's God, the covenant Lord Yahweh, who was to fight their battles. It was God who would fight the Egyptians when Israel had departed from that land. When Pharaoh and his armies had drawn near to the fleeing Israelites, Moses encouraged the fearful of people of God by speaking these words in Exodus 14, 13, and 14. He says, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never 
see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Not only in the exodus out of Egypt, but also in the conquest of Canaan, we see that it is the Lord who fights for his people. Now get this, Moses gave the Israelites laws concerning their warfare in Canaan. He says, this is how you're supposed to do it, and it's not just a suggestion. Here's what he writes. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and say to them, hear, O Israel, Today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you their victory. So through their experiences and through the law that they had been given, Israel knew that fighting on behalf of the people of Israel was God's responsibility. And they wanted a human king to take his place. That confirms that Israel's pursuit of a king at this time, in this place, in this manner, is a rejection of God. Now this exposes another truth about humanity, a truth about us, if we're honest, Even when we know that something we desire will harm us, we have a propensity to desire it and to pursue it. So brothers and sisters, as I close this morning, I ask you, is there something in your life that you are desiring, that you are pursuing, that you know in your heart will harm you, yet you keep wanting it and you keep chasing it? How about we stop doing that? How about we turn from those things that we know will harm us, those things that we know amount to a rejection of God? And let's rather turn to the great king of the universe, Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all that Israel truly desired and all that we truly desire. Let's learn from the mistakes of the Israelites. And that is the main idea from today's passage. We don't need to request a pagan king. The divine king of heaven has already come. We need to heed the warning, the warning that Israel received as they pursued a king and reject the idea that there's anything apart from Jesus who can save us or protect us. And we need to bow to the true king, the king who's not a taker but a giver, the king who gave his life and so much more on top about that. We need to not reject the Lord but rather receive him through his king, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I would pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would help us apply it to our hearts. Help us not to look to earthly kings and rulers, but to King Jesus. Help us not to worship idols. Help us not to desire to live lives the way unbelievers live, but help us to bow our knee to King Jesus. Help us not to reject you, Lord but help us to receive you by receiving your king. Pray this in his name, amen. In response, as we bow our hearts to King Jesus, let's lift our songs in praise and surrender our praise to the one who is worthy and sing praise his name. I invite you to stand and join your voices together singing praise his name. Angels of heaven, 
starry heights the lights of the evening dancing in silent skies brilliance of morning breaking day oh let them praise him praise his name Turn this morning in terms of our benediction to the one we have used as we work through 1 Samuel. It is a responsive benediction, and the congregation's response will be on the screen. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 19 through 24. Do not turn aside from following the Lord, and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver. For they are empty. 
But fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Okay. I can, I, can, I can tell you and you can remember. We'll do it again. The first response is thanks be to God the Father. The second is thanks be to God the Son. And the third is thanks be to God the Spirit. Okay? Let's try this again. Do not turn aside from following the Lord and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver. For they are empty, but the fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Thanks be to God the Father. It has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Thanks be to God the Son. Consider what great things he has done for you. Thanks be to God the Spirit. Praise God from whom I...